All right. Uh, really cool. So the way that this is going to work, we're going to do a little panel here, a little question and answer. Um, we'll spend about 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes, just going over some, some of the guidelines and updated or recommendations for updated guidelines. And then we're going to provide a demonstration on uh, taking a CrossFit workout and adjusting it for different cancer uh, patients and survivors. Yeah? Yep. Uh, it's going to be really cool. So first off, since we're talking about guidelines, my first question, and the way we'll do this, actually this one will be for you, uh, Allison, is what are the current exercise guidelines for cancer patients and survivors? So we're actually really excited. So until recently, the guidelines actually only included cancer survivors and didn't actually touch on patients undergoing treatment for cancer or living with cancer. And so um, most recently, after a lot of advocacy efforts, we've finally gotten the guidelines to include patients undergoing cancer treatment, which we're really excited about. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so the main guidelines uh, are basically 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So if you kind of do that math, that works out to be 30 minutes a day, five days a week as a minimum or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity exercise, so 15 minutes a day, five days a week. We say that in minutes because a lot of times for patients undergoing cancer treatment, the idea of working out or even walking for 30 straight minutes is really intimidating, right? And so at different stages in the journey, that may be broken up into five minutes or 10 minute segments and really we're, we're focused on the cumulative time rather than uh, the the sort of overall duration at a given period of time. Um, the other recommendation that we've now added in is to add resistance training to that two to three days a week. And that was a newer recommendation as well. Um, so as you can all imagine, CrossFit fits in with this very, very nicely, um, as long as you know, we keep the general recommendations in mind. What I tell patients or people undergoing treatment um, who were already CrossFitters is you don't need to scale that back as long as you feel okay. Um, but someone who might be new to CrossFit, right? we want to start really slow here. Um, that is not the person to sort of push to max intensity on you know, day one, week one, or even month one. Really cool. So when were these updated? When did the, when did the updates come out? Um, so the updates that included cancer patients on treatment actually have just come out from uh, American Society for Clinical Oncology this year in 2022. Oh, that's really cool. Really cool. And um, how, how, how can we get better compliance using these guidelines for cancer patients or cancer survivors in the gym? Because it seems like... Um, there's probably an accelerated decline in like the physical condition, especially in cancer patients, where compliance in something like CrossFit would even be more uh, beneficial. So getting them to, to, to get in there and do it consistently is probably even more important than the general population due to the medications and the treatments that they're on. For sure. So one of the things that we know is that the level of fitness, and that may just be true cardiovascular, you know, walking distance VO2 drops precipitously during cancer treatment for almost everyone, um, regardless of whether they undergo surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, some of the newer therapies. Um, and exercise is actually the best way to offset those losses, um, in addition to improving energy and quality of life, um, depression, anxiety, all related to cancer. So. The biggest thing is to sort of meet a patient where they are, right? So again, if you're taking someone who has been a longtime CrossFitter and is now you know, undergoing treatment, we may need to actually pull them back a little bit in the beginning, right? Um, and let them readjust um, to sort of the newer circumstances. For people who are not regularly exercising, it's honestly about getting the word out that this is safe. Okay. For the longest time, cancer patients were told, and doctors like me were telling people that they should not be exercising while they're undergoing treatment for cancer. They were told, rest, conserve your energy, right? You're going to need it for your treatment. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've had increasing amounts of data 
that exercise improves the quality of life for cancer patients and may actually improve cancer therapy. Um, not only that, but trial after trial has shown that this is safe for cancer patients. And so getting that word out there both to patients, physicians, and coaches. I've heard from far too many athletes over the years that have reached out to me on social media and other things that they got turned away from a gym because the coach was nervous and didn't, was afraid of hurting them and didn't really know how to modify appropriately. That's where the idea for this was born, to really get the word out there, not only to patients, but to everyone else, that we need to be really thinking about um, these athletes in our gyms. Are there any effects from cancer treatment on bone density or muscle mass that can be counteracted by functional movements or loading? Absolutely. So, um, you know, every type of cancer, right, has a different type of treatment. And so going into the nitty gritty specifics of each one is more challenging. But when we think about the more common cancers, prostate cancer, breast cancer, right, those cancers specifically are treated with um, medications that block hormone signaling. Those affect bone density. Those affect muscle mass, right? The absolute best way to counteract that while we may give medications is loading the body appropriately. Um, you know, the other ends of that spectrum, we do need to think about, however, patients who have cancer in the bones, right? what we may need to change appropriately for those patients. Um, patients who have lost a lot of muscle mass, um, something we call cachexia during cancer. Um, we may not be able to just load the muscle, right? We also need to think about, you know, their, their nutrition and other things to make sure that we're actually building that back up and not breaking it back down. Awesome. Uh, let's go back to something you said in terms of uh, the confidence of the coach. And then this will be for Amy, because Amy, you did run a program at your affiliate. So obviously, you developed some confidence in your ability and your coach's ability to take on, were they cancer patients or survivors? Um, you can specify which ones or both. And how did you uh, start the program? Um, and, and, and how did you run the program? And how successful was it? So we had a combination of both uh, survivors and people undergoing treatment. And the interesting piece of this was we actually got approached by a, re, uh, um, a cancer center in our area because my dad was one of their patients. And they noticed that my dad was doing really, really well during treatment. And they couldn't figure out why. And so they said to him, you know, why are you doing so well? physically, mentally, and he said, I think it's because I CrossFit every day. <laughs> and, and so then that piqued their interest. They contacted us, and we started, we, we worked with them to develop this program. Um, we worked with um, an oncologist and a surgeon, and, um, you know, they were a little bit um, hesitant about some of the things that we did because obviously they didn't understand they, they weren't crossfitters themselves they didn't understand um, our methodology um, but they you know put a lot of trust in us and we just worked with what, um, what we put together originally was a 12-week program we shortened it to eight weeks that's what we found worked the best but it was where it, it was one crossfit class a week um, we partnered with another gym in our area and they got to do one like um, you know, regular gym workout, but, you know, try Zumba class or a water aerobics class or something that they could, something it, to figure out what it is that would keep them motivated to move. And then once a week, we did a lecture. And it was really awesome because we did, you know, we did this mini version of what is fitness, which is, you know, a keystone lecture of the level one. Um, we did a nutrition 101. We did a cooking demo. We brought in um, psychologists that did goal setting. Um, there was another um, speaker that we had that talked about sexual health af after treatment. And, you know, so it was just, it was an evolving program. I think we ran about 12 sessions over the years. And currently we have a number of those um, people from the participants from our program that are now our regular members. So it's, it's great. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really cool. Uh, bo both of you mentioned nutrition in, in some sense, right? So um, 
what are the current nutrition guidelines, if there are any, uh, for cancer patients and survivors? So this is a place where it's really important for a coach or a gym owner, a doctor and their oncologist and the patient or athlete to all be talking to each other, right? Every type of cancer has their own therapy, their own treatment, and potentially different restrictions or limitations related to that. So our typical, you know, eat nuts and seeds, no sugar, those things are generally good, right? But they not, may not be appropriate for X particular athlete patient. Um, and so this is where, you know, again, really engaging with both the athlete as well as their medical team, even bringing in a registered nutrition who has an expert, a nutritionist who has an expertise in cancer um, can be really helpful. So at different stages of treatment, patients may have different limitations. For example, if someone is on high-dose chemotherapy, we actually ask many of them not to eat a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables um, when their blood counts are particularly low. It puts them at high risk of infection. So things that we might typically recommend to a healthy person with a normal immune system may not be appropriate at that given moment. It may be appropriate three weeks from now or three months from now, but maybe not today. And so this is where we really have to step back, educate ourselves, reach out to people like me. If you're a coach and you don't know what to do, I'm here. I'm on social media. Reach out to me. I am more than happy to help. That's awesome. So as a coach, know your scope, create a team, and, and that's going to be you know, your best setup for success. But this is where teamwork is really important um, and finding the right doctor also, right? Not every oncologist is going to want to engage with you about this. And that athlete patient needs to decide if that's the right doctor for them or not, depending on how important this may be in their life. Um, but choosing to sort of go around the medical system for that, which I unfortunately have seen, can also be quite dangerous in this situation. So it's really important to make a team here. That's really cool. So let's talk about this, and then we'll, we'll maybe get a couple questions from the crowd and roll into the demonstration. But we talked a lot about communicating with the athlete, whether they are a current patient or a survivor. So this would be a question for both of you. What are some, some really important questions to ask right from the start when somebody comes in and they say, hey, I'm either currently being treated for cancer or I'm a survivor of cancer and I want to start doing CrossFit? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start. Yeah. So I think a f one thing that is the most important thing that you can ask anyone, and this is true of any athlete in your gym, is what are you comfortable with people knowing, right? There are a lot of people who don't want everyone in the gym to know that they're undergoing treatment for cancer or any other condition. Um, and I think sometimes we forget to ask that. Right? We want to celebrate that person and all the amazing things that they're doing. They may want the gym to be their safe space where they don't have to talk about that. Right? Obviously, you need to have a conversation with them about the coaches knowing or a particular coach knowing and modifying appropriately. Um, some athletes are very open about this at, at different points in their journeys, and some may not be. Um, the other thing is, you know, what treatment are they on, and have they asked their doctor if it's safe to exercise and if they have any limitations? Right? There should be zero patients who are being told it is not safe to exercise, right? But if they have been, we need to get to the bottom of that and what exactly is happening there at that interaction. Um, that being said, you know, if they have particular limitations related to they had surgery a particular period of time ago or a medication that they're on, um, for example, many patients on chemotherapy, their blood counts will get quite low. Their platelet counts will get quite low, right? Things should not be going over their head when their platelet counts are low. That is exceptionally dangerous. No matter how good of an athlete you are, no matter how long you've crossfitted, no matter how confident you are that you can bail appropriately, if something is over your head and your platelets are real low, you risk bleeding into your brain, right? So these are the types of questions, very specific. Where are you in your journey? What are you on? Do you have limitations? Have you talked to your doctor about this? Really cool. Amy, do you have anything to add to that? 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, that was a lot of what we did. I mean, we, we needed to make sure that we were having these open conversations with the care providers because they're the experts. Um, you know, any kind of weight restrictions, any kind of, you know, movement restrictions. Like the big one that came up for us was when people had a port and, you know, what that position put them in for, you know, certainly don't want them whipping out kipping pull-ups when they've got a port. <laughs> so Even burpees, right? Ports tend to go right here where we give chemotherapy. Right? Burpees can be a real challenge for people. Um, so we really need to you know, kind of think individually about you know, e each participant. Awesome. Uh, last question before we open to the crowd. So both of you have used CrossFit uh, with cancer patients or survivors. What are some of the ro results that you have seen uh, in doing so? Um, you know, I, I think we can't overstate you know, the physical results, um, you know, Amy's dad's story is the perfect one. I don't need to add my own to that. I have plenty, but, um, you know, we're not talking about games level athletes, though we can, and I have treated professional athletes as well. Um, but, you know, we're talking about maintaining functionality at home for older adults. We're talking about living independently, right, through treatment. Um, those, I, I just can't overstate what that means because patients hear the word cancer and their life changes immediately, right? And they're automatically thinking about time in the hospital, time away from work, time away from their family, potentially, you know, being either living with family or living in a facility and whatever we can do, right, to make that process less scary, less intimidating and more independent, you know, that is by far, I think, any medical benefits aside, that is by far the best thing that we can do. Um, but certainly helping patients maintain, you know, bone strength, muscle strength, body weight. So one of the biggest reasons we actually have to take patients off treatment is that they lose too much weight. And then we either have to scale back treatment or even stop treatment. So helping people maintain their body weight during treatment and maintain lean body mass is actually critical to their care. Um, and we certainly have seen that uh, with, with CrossFit and other exercise methodologies. And that's really where the resistance training part of this comes in. Really cool. Thank you. Amy? I would echo everything that Allison said. And for us, it's really about quality of life and um, the mental health piece. And uh, a lot of the feedback we've had from our participants have been around the idea of um, that they feel so competent and capable when they've been told all along, like, you're so sick and you're so weak and you shouldn't be doing things. And then all of a sudden they realize, wait a second, I can do these things. And it's huge for their mental health. And overall, you know, all of those issues that, that Allison talked about, just the quality of life is, is just better when they're, you know, doing CrossFit and staying healthy. I would assume the community aspect of it is uh, a major part of this as well. For sure, I, you know, what I actually got most interested in this, I, I have a PhD in the effects of exercise on cancer care, but sort of lived it when I was actually competing in CrossFit. Mike and I used to compete together in the old days. Um, and an athlete in my gym started undergoing treatment for breast cancer. And she was really open about that with all of us. And I mean, the number of times people in our gym shave their head, the number of times people in our gym, she was single, came with her to treatment because she didn't have someone to go with her, right? We became her family and she became part of ours. Um, and I, I think, you know, for her, uh, she will just tell you, I mean, that was a defining moment in her life. She had never been an athlete. She actually started CrossFit at 375 pounds. Um, and she's still a member of that gym, and it's been 12 years. Oh, that's amazing. That's a cool story. Really cool. Uh, I think for a few minutes, we'll open up some questions. If anybody has any questions, then we'll roll into the demonstration. Any questions uh, from the crowd? Noah's not here, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bedoff. That was awesome, Amy. Thank you. I'm curious uh, for patients who may be recently diagnosed and are working with an oncologist who may not be familiar with the new guidelines, is there a resource or someplace that they can go to access those, to take that into their appointments, to get them up to speed? As you know, sometimes it takes us a while to catch up with newer recommendations. So. Absolutely. Uh, great question. Thanks, Tom. So, you know, 
first and foremost, um, these guidelines are now published on multiple oncology forums. Um, so not that everyone has read them, but they are available widely at universally accepted oncology forums. The biggest of which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. That's who boards all of us and certifies all of us. Um, that being said, uh, one of the things that I'm working on um, is getting kind of a toolkit out there um, through CrossFit Health that basically will give, you know, just some high level, here are the guidelines, um, here are some things we might need to think about, and, you know, where to get more information. And my goal is to have that out there. People can go find it on CrossFit Health, even, um, you know, just Google it, and hopefully download it, bring it to their doctor, and start a conversation. So you mentioned the light bulb moment when people start to perceive what they're actually capable of doing. And, and I mainly work with older adults in a group-based setting, 70, 80-year-old folks. And most of the folks I work with, they've had a diagnosis of cancer. They have you know, defeated that diagnosis and lived 10, 15, 20, 25 years with a lot of that baggage and a lot of... Uh, really poor perceptions of what they're capable of doing. And that light bulb moment, I feel like, happens in a very big window or a long window for some and others, it's like the first class. So from like the nuts and bolts of your program, are you like doing individual sessions with people to help them kind of ease them into the class like an on-ramp or are you throwing people right in with the rest of the group, case by case scenario? Like how do you think about that with folks where their perception of what they're capable of doing doesn't match reality of what they're actually capable of doing? That's a great question. So our program was, we had a specific class time for that group of people. And what we, how we started was um, kind of a meeting, a kickoff meeting at the Cancer Center with that group of people that had been accepted into that, into that session. And we just gave them a lot of information about what to expect. Um, and so then the first time they showed up in, a, in our gym, you know, they look around, they're like, this doesn't look like a gym. Like, what is this place, right? Um, and, and so we had already started those conversations. We told them that we were going to probably push them farther than what they believed that they could, farther than they could go. But we asked for their trust. And, and we just knew that, you know, that we could, and, and in that environment with, you know, people just like them, that they would you know, together as a team that we could, you know, move this forward. I think one, one of the coolest moments I've had recently, um, young woman um, who had sarcoma a few years ago, and for those of you who are less familiar, so sarcoma is a bone or soft tissue cancer. Um, many of these people undergo amputations or have significant functional limitations because uh, we take out bone and muscle in, in different areas. And this is a young woman, she's several years out now from being treated for her cancer. She's been disease free for a few years. And just two weeks ago, I like get goosebumps. She identified herself as an athlete and not a survivor. And I literally just started crying, right? I mean, the day that that flip, switch flipped, right? This is a young woman, she does not have cancer anymore, but she saw herself in this very limited way and was really ho holding herself back um, and, you know, she said, wow, I walked into the gym today and I felt like an athlete. And I, I mean, I was just floored. I just got goosebumps. <laughs> Seriously. That's awesome. Um, let's do one more question if there are any before we, we start the demo. Okay.